The National Sleep Foundation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving health and well being through sleep education and advocacy. We're the first organization of our type to focus solely on sleep health for the general public. And for over 30 years, the National Sleep Foundation consistently has been a voice for sleep health for the public, educating people about the importance of sleep, about the importance to, of prioritizing sleep, and about the effects of good sleep on our overall health and well being. The National Sleep Foundation prioritizes inclusivity and equity in all aspects of our organization. The National Sleep Foundation is committed to helping anyone and everyone be their best slept self. And your best slept self is the renewed you after taking small steps each day and each night that make a big difference in your sleep health overall. So thank you for entrusting the National Sleep Foundation as your sleep health resource and thank you for supporting the National Sleep Foundation. Hello, I'm John Lopos, and I'm the CEO of the National Sleep Foundation. This year, the National Sleep Foundation is proud to host our annual Drowsy Driving Prevention Week, it takes place from November 6th to 13th. Drowsy Driving Prevention Week is one of our longest running educational campaigns with 2022 marking our 15th anniversary. This is a sleep health and safety campaign that serves as our annual focal point for the public about the importance of having adequate sleep before driving. Drowsy driving is a risk to public health and our goal is for every driver to get the sleep they need so that they can be rested and alert to drive safely. Drowsy driving is impaired driving and it's often referred to as the fourth B among drunk, drugged, and distracted causes of impaired driving. And so our attention to this has been part of our mission and part of our advocacy efforts since our founding in 1990. Drowsy Driving Prevention Week is how NSF connects our efforts promoting sleep health to sleep health and safety. We've made great strides to increase the general recognition of the importance of driving alert and that drowsy driving crashes are preventable, but we have much more work to do together. This year's campaign theme is Sleep First, Drive Alert. We want to help each and every member of the public get the sleep they need before they get behind the wheel. And that starts with our promise to the public to help anyone and everyone be their best slept self. Go to our website, thensf.org, to learn more about how you can be your best slept self, plus steps you can take to stay alert behind the wheel and help prevent drowsy driving. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Joseph Drzewski. Vice President of Research and Scientific Affairs at the National Sleep Foundation. This is my good friend and colleague. Hi, I'm Dr. Natalie Dodovich. I'm the Environmental Fellow for the National Sleep Foundation. Today, we're going to be speaking about drowsy driving and sleep health. The National Sleep Foundation is dedicated to improving well being and health through sleep education and advocacy efforts. And here are the goals of the National Sleep Foundation. Sleep health is accepted as a crucial measure of overall health. The natural sleep-wake process is understood as the basis for healthy sleep. Community, infrastructure, and environments respect sleep health. And sleep science and insight are rapidly incorporated into accessible health products and services. Now, as you know, Natalie, at the National Sleep Foundation, we work tirelessly, no pun intended, <laughs> to advance theory and research awareness and education, and practice and behavior, all as they pertain to sleep health and sleep health equity. All of this culminates with NSF's promise to the public to help everyone and anyone be their best slept self. And how can we be our best slept selves? Well, there's six small steps that you can take towards better sleep. And I think it helps to think about these as what can I do during the day and what can I do in the evening? So starting with the day, light is so important. Try to get exposure to bright light, outdoor natural light if you can. Also try to engage in regular exercise. So 30 minutes, five days a week is great. And then if we can be consistent in the timing of the meals that we have during our days, 
This also helps to promote healthy sleep. Those don't seem too difficult. No, no. <laughs> we also have some evening tips that we'd like to share. The first one is to avoid stimulating substances near bedtime. So we tell everyone to avoid nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol close to bedtime. Mm -hmm. We also recommend everyone enjoy a relaxing wind down routine, keep consistent bed and wake times, and allow yourself seven to nine hours of sleep. And lastly, we know how important the sleep environment is for people to get a good night's sleep. So we want everyone to keep their rooms cool, quiet, and dark. Yeah. Think of a cave, but without dam. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when we're talking about good sleep, it helps us to feel good, but there are also important reasons why we should try to prioritize sleep. And the place where I usually start when I think about the benefits of good sleep is right here with your heart. Sleep is essential for good cardiac health. In fact, the American Heart Association has included sleep duration as one of their pillars for heart health. Sleep is also important for maintaining a healthy weight and metabolic health. Also, our well-being, mood, and preventing depression and anxiety are dependent on good sleep. Relatedly, our social interactions, our social functioning are all related to how well we have slept. As well as our immune health and functioning. And our ability to think, remember, pay attention, and focus. What we would largely call your cognitive abilities are greatly dependent on the quantity and quality of your sleep. And something else that sleep is important for is safe driving. So we know that drowsy driving is really impaired driving. Without a doubt, Natalie. In fact, very rigorous research has shown that 18 hours without sleep is equivalent to a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08, the level that's legally impaired in all 50 states. Yes, very serious. So what do we know about how much sleep we need in order to drive safe? That's an excellent question, Natalie. The National Sleep Foundation convened a group of national and international experts on this very topic. Those experts reviewed all the available science and came to some very clear conclusions and recommendations. The first thing they suggested is that if you're getting no or very little sleep each night, zero, one, or two hours of sleep, you are unfit to be behind the wheel. You should not be driving that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you're getting an intermediary amount of sleep, think about three, four, or five hours. In this case, you should use very high caution. Likely, you should not be behind the wheel. But if you are, it's very, very risky. And lastly, if you slept more than six hours per night, our experts think that you're pretty well able to drive at that point. That's really helpful, Joe. So... What are the drivers themselves saying about their own readiness to drive? Yeah, interestingly here, the expert recommendations don't appear to have translated into driver confidence. What I mean by that is that nearly two out of 10 drivers when surveyed have confidence in their ability to drive when they've slept very, very little the night before. In fact, nearly four in 10 drivers express confidence in their ability to drive if they slept only three to four hours. Mm. That number rose to almost 80% of drivers having confidence in their ability to safely drive when they've slept between five and six hours the night before. Again, all of these levels are levels where you should not be driving or where you should have extremely high caution. Now, lastly, a place where our experts and drivers uh, agree would be if you slept more than six hours, nearly 100% of drivers suggest that they have high ability to drive safely. That's really helpful to think about the fit between driver perception and the actual data. Uh, when we're thinking about drowsy driving, it's important to think about the consequences associated with it. So how big a problem is this? Well, we know that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and AAA have each conducted significant research to estimate the scope of the drowsy driving problem. Estimates range from 90,000 to 100,000 drowsy driving-related accidents occurring per year. Wow. 
And importantly, the vast majority of experts agree that the problem is likely much wider spread, likely three times the size of these estimates. Hmm. Here at the NSF, we have our own data that suggests that the vast majority of adults, 60%, have engaged in drowsy driving, defined as having driven while so tired that you have a hard time keeping your eyes open. So this is a big proportion of the U.S. population. Importantly, we also know that drowsy driving is concentrated within specific communities. For example, young drivers, teens, we know these groups are at elevated risk for not only drowsy driving, but also the consequences associated with drowsy driving, accidents. Mm -hmm. This is even more true or especially true for young males. Other factors to consider beyond age are occupations. So we know that shift workers, mm. individuals with um, rotating shifts or individuals with extended working hours experience a six-fold increased risk for drowsy driving. And commercial drivers are also at an elevated risk for drowsy driving. Another important point to consider is that we find that marginalized or underrepresented individuals are more likely to be concentrated in these types of occupations, making them more at risk themselves for drowsy driving. That's a good point, Natalie. And in fact, data collected by the National Sleep Foundation indicate that individuals who identify as either Black or Hispanic are at a much more high risk or much more likely to drive drowsy on a, a regular basis. So they do so more frequently. And when you engage in a risky behavior at higher frequencies, you're more likely to experience negative outcomes associated with that behavior. So we see the occupational risk playing out here. Beyond the immediate personal consequences of drowsy driving, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has estimated the annual costs associated with fatigue-related crashes resulting in injury or death to be 109 billion each and every year, which is just a staggering number for such a preventable behavior. No kidding, it is a huge number, a huge number. Now it's not that people don't believe that drowsy driving is risky. Again, the National Sleep Foundation has conducted polls where we show that 95% of the US adult population believe that drowsy driving is a risky behavior. Unfortunately, it just doesn't seem that this increased risk has yet to translate into avoiding this behavior. Mm -hmm. So given the extreme consequences of drowsy driving, what, if anything, can we do about it? Well, the good news is that we know there's warning signs you can pay attention to when you're driving, and then there are actionable steps that you can take. So if you find that you are frequently blinking, your eyelids are getting heavy, if you have drifting thoughts and it's hard to focus or repeated yawning, this is time for you to take action. And what do we mean when we say that? Well, the first thing I like to always think of is to be proactive, plan ahead, right? Plan regular stops in any long trips. We recommend that you plan a stop every two hours or about every hundred miles. We also suggest you bring a companion with you. Now, not only will this just make your long trips more enjoyable, but this companion can also look out for the warning signs, can engage in stimulating conversation, these sorts of things, and you can share the driving load. Of course, if you experience any of these warning signs, Natalie, pull over. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. When you pull over, take a nap. Even 20 minutes can be reinvigorating. Drink some caffeine. Do whatever it takes to get to your final destination healthy and safe. And of course, Joe, one of the easiest things that you can do to prevent drowsy driving is to try to get an adequate amount of sleep. And we're lucky that the National Sleep Foundation has helped achieve a consensus about how much sleep we actually should be getting. So for the average adult, you need seven to nine hours to feel well rested. For older adults, it's a little less, seven to eight hours. And importantly, for teenagers, it's more, eight to 10 hours. We know some people will fall outside of these ranges, but these are good guidelines for knowing how much sleep you need. And there is, Natalie, a direct relationship between how much sleep you get on a nightly basis and how often or frequently you engage in drowsy driving. 
So our data suggests that drivers who are better slept, who have slept there, you know, these recommendations, this duration, mm -hmm. they're simply less likely to drive drowsy and less likely to do so on a regular basis. The main point is get the sleep that you need and you'll be less likely to put yourself and others in danger by driving drowsy. Yes. The National Sleep Foundation is dedicated to improving health and well-being through sleep education and advocacy efforts. NSF is the trusted resource for sleep science, for healthy sleep habits, including information on drowsy driving and for sleep disorders to medical professionals, patients, and the public at large. There is only one National Sleep Foundation. For more information, I encourage everyone to visit our website at thensf.org. And lastly, we'd like to leave you with some important messages about drowsy driving. Thank you for listening. Be safe, everyone. I want to welcome Tom DeSalvi to our campaign for Drowsy Driving Prevention Week. Uh, Tom is the Vice President of Safety, Driver Training, and Compliance at Schneider National. In this role, Tom's responsible for researching and implementing breakthrough safety technologies and processes to help prevent motor vehicle crashes. This is consistent with Schneider's core value of safety first and always. He joined Schneider in 1991 after serving as an officer in the U.S. Navy, and Tom's also a member of the Board of Directors of the National Sleep Foundation. Welcome, Tom. At Schneider, we have a, a multi-pronged fatigue prevention program, and, and I'll talk about each of those prongs. We, we start with education and awareness. Uh, while most uh, adults realize that you need to have sleep to, to perform well the next day, they don't, don't always understand the detail. Uh, they don't always understand the physiological need for sleep. And that's what we train our driver associates when, when they first start at Schneider and provide that type of awareness throughout the course of their tenure at Schneider. Uh, what is the importance of, of consecutive hours of sleep, of REM sleep, uh, the, the importance of of being alert throughout the course of the, the, the next day or when you need what we would refer to as strategic napping. We, we cover that in our education. We also cover uh, signs and symptoms of fatigue. And, and I think to many people, uh, it would seem, well, isn't it obvious when you're tired? But the reality is for, for many of us, the researchers will tell us that we tend to be the, the worst judge of our own fatigue. And so by being able to, to uh, articulate signs and symptoms, help driver associates recognize, yeah, I might be getting tired and it's time to start thinking about a, a place to get some rest. And then, so of course, then finally, how do you get proper rest? Uh, that is something else that we cover in our training that would include anywhere from, as I mentioned, the, the, the napping when appropriate during the course of the day or the consecutive hours of sleep when your, day, your duty shift is done, uh, how to sleep in your truck and, and make the environment uh, comfortable and conducive to sleep and and once you're at home how to do the same thing so we, we do spend a lot of time on education in that space uh, in addition another prong is our operational pr uh, processes we want to make sure that our driver leaders our frontline leaders not only understand our tenants of fatigue management but also they are looking for uh, specific things that they can coach the drivers on making sure that every dispatch has time for proper rest for our drivers. And also uh, another important piece is coaching our drivers on of the avoidance of what we would call shift start variation. So someone that might drive during the, the day and sleep at night, but then drives at night and sleeps during the day and vice versa, be because of the nature of their loads or delays or traffic, we, we know that that is something to be avoided because that's very difficult on your body in terms of getting restful sleep. So that's something that we educate our, our operations leaders on as well so that we can continue that awareness with our driver associates. At Schneider, we also have a, a sleep disorder screening program and uh, arguably we were one of the, the first uh, trucking companies in the industry to develop a comprehensive uh, sleep apnea program. Uh, we started this back in 2006 and, and the idea was that treatment for sleep disorders, again, Many, many people don't realize that they have a sleep disorder, and so it, it's not uh, obvious to them. By all drivers coming to Schneider getting screened for sleep apnea, we're then able to identify those that might be at risk for sleep apnea. We send them to uh, a clinic to be 
tested for sleep apnea at no cost to, to our driver associate. And, and if our associates have Schneider medical benefits, there is no cost for CPAP uh, therapy and treatment. Uh, because we, we realize that if you're suffering from sleep apnea, not being treated and utilizing your treatment every day is not only uh, important for safety, it's important for the long-term health of the individual. And certainly that's a, a value of ours at Schneider. Finally, the, the last tenant that I'll mention is that we leverage technology. So, so we have education, we have processes, we have sleep disorder screening and treatment. But even in the cab, when, when we still need assistance, we're looking for technology and we've found it and we leverage it that will assist our associates actively. So for example, when the truck is drifting uh, from, from the lane, we have lane departure warning systems to alert them that you've drifted from your lane and it's the reminder that it, it, it's time to find a safe place to park. Or collision mitigation, uh, our radar system that will identify which is a particularly beneficial in, in the evening hours, there's a slower moving or stopped object in your path and you're not braking fast enough. And if necessary, it will take control of the truck and provide uh, braking for the driver. So, so just a host of things, but all of which I, I would emphasize and, and I think important for any company that has a fatigue management program is all these tenants are under the umbrella of a safety culture. At, at Schneider, our primary core value is safety first and always. And while our work is important, we, we are very clear that nothing that we do or nothing that we haul is worth risk hurting ourselves or others. So we make sure that our driver associates know that as the, what we were we use the phrase, the captain of the ship, whether it's bad weather, whether you're sick, or if you're tired, regardless of how many, how many hours you've driven a day, maybe you've only driven an hour, uh, you should. You think you shouldn't be tired, but you are. We want you to find a safe place to park, get off the road, contact us with an update, and get your rest. Because again, nothing to us is more important than safety, and proper rest is is critical uh, to staying alert behind the wheel. Thanks, Tom. Tom, I have a two part question for you. Uh, first, uh, thinking about your experiences. What do you think the role of industry can be yours and others like uh, vehicle manufacturers or mobility companies, even motor clubs and insurers? Um, what's the role moving forward to broaden efforts to help ensure alert driving? That's the first part. Second part is uh, what might be the most immediate first next steps uh, for these stakeholders to take? From my perspective, what I think motor carriers and freight haulers can do with respect to, to fatigue management immediately, as well as motor, motor clubs or insurance companies or even automobile manufacturers, I think it, it, it's, again, as I mentioned, you can start with that foundation of understanding that it, it's more than just sleep. It's getting restful sleep before you get behind the wheel. So I think for motor carriers, uh, two things. One is ensuring that that their operators understand the importance of avoiding rotating shifts whenever possible, or the challenge that is involved if for some reason your shift has to rotate, that you may be sleeping during a period of circadian low, or that recognize you may need to take more breaks because this is a challenge from, from your sleep schedule, but ultimately avoiding it. That would be the first thing. And then the, the second item for, for motor carriers or freight haulers would be to state very clearly uh, to, to all associates that productivity is important, but nothing is more important than safety. Um, I, I think a lot of organizations would say, well, that goes without say. And my experience is you need to say it. You need to clearly articulate it for associates to recognize this is our number one priority. And to achieve that, you need to uh, have proper rest. For the uh, insurers, for the, for the motor clubs, for the automobile manufacturers, uh, again, although not professional drivers, I, I think it's important that, that the public in general understand uh, what are the best times to start a trip or to avoid a trip based on circadian rhythms. Uh, am I going to be driving into a sunset or driving into a sunrise, periods of time where, where you might be sleepier? What, what are my circadian rhythms? Why does that matter when I drive? And I think more importantly is just the whole idea of of, you know, it's a huge responsibility getting behind the wheel of, a, of an automobile. And you need to make sure if you're making a trip that you are well rested. And well rested means getting consecutive hours of sleep the night before, the day before, depending on, on what uh, time period a, a motorist is going to begin a, a trip. So, so certainly, again, creating that foundation of understanding. 
then as a follow-up or, or what the next best approach would be is once you've established this, this degree of, of education, I, I do think there's an opportunity for technology to be standard in, in uh, motor vehicles, whether it's a class A tractor or whether it's, it's uh, an, an automobile. Think, things that will actively help the motorist either recognize that, that they are tired and they need to find a safe place to, to rest because that is the, the, the ultimate goal, or at the very least, something that could be a, a safety net for them. If they're operating tired and they don't realize it, there's technology that will, re, that will prevent them from uh, getting in, into an accident, such as I mentioned earlier, whether it's lane departure warning or collision mitigation. I do believe for the future, as we see the improvements made in autonomous vehicles, the technology for autonomous vehicles is so great that, that we were finding that that technology, until it's ready for fully autonomous, is something that can be le leveraged for, for automobiles and trucks uh, to also assist the operator. So be, be, before we get to that point of full autonomy, having the type of technology, the LIDAR and, and the, the qual high quality radar, et cetera, can be of, of great assistance to motorists, uh, particularly those that don't realize they're tired and realize and eventually are gonna be alerted that you need to find a safe place to park and get your rest. And, and of course, the final step. I mean, I know I've talked about education. I've talked about uh, technology. I, I think for a lot of people, the question is gonna be, wh where are these resources? How do I get this information? And uh, I, I would of, of course recommend, the first recommendation would be the National Sleep Foundation. The, the National Sleep Foundation is the, is the authority for sleep health uh, and provides expert insights for all types of, uh, of questions or challenges regarding proper sleep, uh, proper rest, sleep disorders. And that would be my, my first recommendation in terms of where somebody can go to find more information. Every day on U.S. roadways, about 118 people lose their lives. And it could be that up to 20% of those lives lost are due to drowsy driving. Now we know impaired driving is not acceptable in our society. But over the last few decades, impaired driving is mostly focused on drunk driving, drugged, or distracted. And during my time at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, within the U.S. Department of Transportation, we believe that there really needed to be a fourth D, drowsy, because drowsy driving is impaired driving. And so now really impaired driving needs to be thought about in terms of drunk, drugged, distracted, and drowsy driving. And one of the things that I like to point out is that not everybody in their car has been drinking or is on drugs, which could be over the counter, uh, it could be prescription, could be illicit. Not everyone's on their phone or distracted, but everyone behind the wheel to be safe has to be awake and even better alert. And so what's really interesting is the one requirement for sure is that people have to be awake and alert to safely drive their vehicle. And so anything, anything that impairs that ability puts not only you and your life, but the people around you at risk. And so it's really important, having been the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, not only did we want to talk about the four Ds, but we talked about why addressing drowsy driving is so important. And there's several ways that NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and the U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT, can help basically save lives and prevent injuries on our roadways related to drowsy driving. So it's critical for us to be talking about drowsy driving as impaired driving. It just validates the fact that it is not acceptable in our society to drive when you're drowsy. Another critical element is we have a lot of education programs about impaired driving, of which there should be similar parallel programs on drowsy driving. So people understand that getting the appropriate sleep, keeping a stable schedule, these things are critical to being able to drive, not just awake, but alert. We also know that there are some organizations like MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, 40 years ago, they came on and basically helped our society realize that driving drunk was not acceptable. And over the next 15 years, they probably helped create close to 250 new laws to address drunk driving. There is a similar need for drowsy driving. 
because if you have laws, that gives you an opportunity for high visibility enforcement for us to go after folks who are driving drowsy. And again, they're not just a risk to themselves, they're a risk to everyone else on the road as well. Another thing that's really important to realize is that you know if somebody gets pulled over because they think they've been drinking alcohol, we do have a breathalyzer. And we basically have an opportunity to test that breath alcohol content. Unfortunately, we do not have a fatigalizer. And so that's one of the challenges we have with drowsy driving is if someone gets pulled over, um, we don't really have a roadside test to determine whether or not they're impaired due to drowsy driving. So again, another role for NHTSA and DOT is to help us develop methodology so that we can test not just for enforcement, but for helping people understand when they shouldn't be on the road, drowsy driving. The last thing I just want to say is, I think anybody would get behind the wheel. You need your hands on the wheel, your mind in the game, um, and being vigilant and alert all the time. Anything that impairs you in any way puts you and those around you, including the family that you may have in your car, your friends, etc., at risk for losing a life or serious injury. And so one of the things I love literally about Drowsy Driving Prevention Week is the fact we finally and are, are absolutely focused on making sure that people know not what you, the risks are, we understand what those are. What's more important is there's a chance for everyone to get educated about what it means to get appropriate sleep, keep a stable schedule, and make sure that when you're behind the wheel, you're alert, awake, and it's your peak performance.